For over a decade, between 1997 and retirement of the aircraft in 2010, the RAAF's F-111 mission simulator performed a vital role in keeping aircrew flying Australia's main strategic fighter bomber mission ready. Located at Amberley Air Base in South East Queensland, the home of Australia's F-111 fighting squadrons, the mission simulator was the result of a unique partnership between Australian defence industry and the Royal Australian Air Force. RAF Base Amberley is the uh, home of the F-111. All of the boys and girls, the men and women who fly this aeroplane, come through the simulator on a very regular basis as part of their initial training and as part of their ongoing currency training. And here we teach them how to use the aircraft systems, we teach them how to fight, we put them into simulated combat environments, the likes of which they can only dream of. Anything that the aeroplane is ever likely to be called upon to do, we'll do with them in the simulator. We take the best, we make them better comprising a supercomputer to drive the simulations, an F-111 cockpit with electromechanical controls, and an IMAX-style screen onto which the high-definition, immersive simulation was projected, the entire complex was controlled from the instructor operator station. Much more than a simple flight simulator, the mission simulator allowed instructors to throw aircrew into complex combat environments. There, they faced multiple enemy air, ground and sea threats, reacting realistically to every move. The F-111 mission simulator allowed Australian aircrew to train for combat scenarios they could never experience in the real aircraft during peacetime. It allowed the RAAF to establish and maintain a credible strategic deterrent in the region for over a decade. There were a lot of things uh, that you couldn't do in, in the aeroplane that you could actually do in the simulator. A lot of the threats, the service to air missiles, in a normal training mission in the aeroplane, you, you couldn't replicate them. But it was a, uh, a man pad, yep. so we should have got flares out. Yep. These four 10 minute films illustrate use of the simulator to train aircrew over a two year posting in Australia's F 111 squadrons. From learning the basics of how to turn on the engines right through to leading multiple aircraft strike packages against heavily defended targets. The F-111 was an astonishing aircraft. First developed in the early 1960s, at the height of the Cold War, it was unique amongst the fast jets. Designed for high-speed, low-level penetration of enemy airspace to deliver weapons in all weather conditions, its swept wing design and incredible top speed gave it an effective working life of nearly 40 years. The F-111 mission simulator, developed by the RAAF and TALUS Australia, was astonishing in its own right. Nothing like it had ever been developed in Australia. With its advanced training functionality, it reduced risks for aircrew, allowed the RAAF to push the skills of its F-111 squadrons to the highest levels, and extended the life of the aircraft. Yep. Down at that stage. New flight crew arriving for the six-month conversion course are under great stress. They know that up to 20% of them will not make the cut to become operational crew members. Instructors in the simulator also feel the pressure. Their job is to help the RAAF train candidates who have that special combination of intelligence and skills essential to flying a strike aircraft at two and a half times the speed of sound. They are also tasked with the difficult job of identifying those who lack the right stuff. The effectiveness of Australia's strategic defence depends on it. So we're training in two very safety critical systems on the aeroplane and if what the guys and girls are seeing in the simulator is not exactly as it is for the aeroplane, they'll develop bad habits or use the system in the incorrect way. So it is very, very critical to safety that those systems were, uh, were spot on. The pilots, because of the fidelity of the, of the device, take all training serious. And if they screw up, there's a, a process in place that, that the, the, the mishaps go back in to, through the system. So it is not a toy, it's not a, it's a training device. 
new crews discover that they have to go back to flight school basics. F-111 instructors refer to them as HUD dependent. Having done all their initial jet training on PC-9s and then Hawks, new crews have become accustomed to modern heads-up displays, feeding them essential information as they fly. First, instructors take crews on a leap back into aviation history. As the F-111's cockpit dates back to the 1960s, pilots and navigators relearn the skills of flying using old-fashioned instrumentation. Here, the extreme mechanical realism of the simulator cockpit is crucial. Every dial, gauge and pedal is calibrated to react exactly like the real instruments in the aircraft. During the simulator's development, engineers worked hand in hand with RAAF flight crews using real-time telemetry collected by the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. This ensured that the feedback and sensations experienced by crew in the simulator would be as close as possible to reality. Complex electromechanical systems provide exactly the right weighting to the joystick and pedals. But at the same time, Flight crew have to deal with an array of new technologies and capabilities never encountered during their initial single-engine jet training. During the 1990s, a series of upgrades to the avionics and weapons systems enhanced the F-111 to a new level of deadly capability. Five. Captured. Authorised. Checking. Simulate. Bomb's gone. Pave tag is a very important part of the F-111 capability. It's, a, it's an imaging system that allows you to detect targets in all sorts of, all sorts of night conditions and day, and then use a, a laser to target those for precision guided munitions. As a stable and reliable weapons platform, the F-111 was unsurpassed, and for the last 15 years of its life was capable of delivering an array of dumb bombs, laser guided bombs, infrared air-to-air -air missiles, harpoon anti-ship missiles, and finally, the AGM-142 standoff missile. All of these, from low level, at high speed, and in all weather conditions. During the first six months of their conversion training, new crews follow a strict syllabus. This starts on day one with the basics, such as turning the engines and systems on. At the end of the six months, crews must be capable of flying the aircraft on instruments and basic operations of its weapons and avionics. From the instructor operator station, instructors feed malfunctions repeatedly into the system to test the reactions of the crew. Crews learn to recognise an engine fire or hot start and how to react avoiding possible catastrophe should this occur in the real aircraft. They learn how to manipulate the twin turbofan engines and swing wings on takeoff and landing. They also learn basic procedures for the weapon systems, terrain following radar and other avionics so they can operate the aircraft even though they're not yet ready to take it into combat. All this takes place for a tiny cost compared to the cost per hour needed to put the real planes in the air. At the same time, instructors can subject the new pilots to the stresses and malfunctions they could never face without catastrophic consequences in the real world. The simulator was also used to train ground crew in maintenance tasks. Maintenance personnel spend up to 25 hours training in the simulator. This frees up aircraft which would otherwise have been grounded to allow the training to occur. Also, just as with flight crew, this allows technicians and other ground crew to have hands-on experience with simulated malfunctions not otherwise encountered during operations. Faults ranging from engines running roughly to a fire or explosion are all situations which ground crew must learn to recognise and manage. The simulator's been, been critical in all aspects of F-111 operations. I think one of the, one of the main things is, is been the ability to sort of uh, test crews on a lot of their procedures and their safety responses. 
In fact, I remember when we had the fuel tank explosion in Darwin, one of the things we could run all the crews through was a very similar scenario, watch their reactions, uh, help them with, with various aspects of, of how they actually respond to the emergencies. It's been a great investment for the Australian Government.